Oi, pessoal. Aqui é a Alexia. Bom, antes de começar, eu queria falar umas coisinhas aqui com vocês. Nós estamos preparando coisas muito bacanas para 2020. Então, a cada mês, nós teremos um challenge diferente. Ou seja, um desafio. Pelos 12 meses do ano que vem, nós vamos ter desafios sobre temas específicos que vão te ajudar a melhorar o seu inglês. Por exemplo, nós vamos ter challenges sobre phrasal verbs, sobre prepositions e como aprender gramática sem precisar usar livros didáticos. Vai ser muito legal, a gente está super animado com isso e queremos muito, muito, muito que você participe. Então, se você é sério com o seu inglês, você deve participar dos challenges. Para saber mais sobre esse e muitos outros assuntos, vá lá no inglesnicru.com. Ok, now on with the show. Oi, oi, oi! Bem-vindos a mais um episódio aqui do Inglês de Necro Rádio. Bom, galera, o que eu tenho para falar para vocês é o seguinte. Você que está em casa aqui agora, né, tem mais tempo de praticar o inglês, porque, gente, não adianta vocês só escutarem o nosso Inglês de Necro Rádio, né? Vocês também têm que falar, têm que abrir a boca e perder esse medo de falar inglês. E é falando que se aprende. E com isso, nós continuamos com o nosso parceiro Cambly, claro... E vamos dar uma aula de graça para vocês testarem essa plataforma. E lá no Cambly, você vai ter professores online 24 horas por dia. E você pode escolher o tipo de sotaque, o tipo de região, o que, que a pessoa faz, se você quiser falar mais sobre business ou só conversação, digamos assim. Além disso, eles também estão oferecendo lives semanais, estão fazendo blog posts, estão fazendo e-books. Então, isso tudo vocês podem acompanhar diretamente no link que eu coloquei aqui embaixo para os conteúdos gratuitos do Cambly. Mas já adiantando, é o www.brasil.cambly.com barra lives. Gente, é só ir aqui na show notes e acessar, tá? Então é isso. Lembrando que a aula de inglês de graça no Cambly é com código inglês de Necro Podcast. É isso. Um beijo grande e agora vamos aproveitar juntinhos esse episódio de hoje. Então vamos lá, todo mundo junto comigo. Now, on with the show. Okay, so you talked about on the first lesson trying to kind of shock your students into recognizing the misdeeds of their ways. How does that reaction normally play out? I imagine a lot of students are shocked, and I imagine a lot of students are not very thrilled about the prospect of having to totally change their their approach to English. Yes, indeed. I've had a couple of people shed a few tears, actually, just get overwhelmed with, I suppose, regrets over wasted time and wasted money. Um, I've had people get really enthusiastic because they realize, okay, there is another way and I can get results. So the whole, the whole spectrum, um, once that shock is done and they agree to join the class, well, then we start the hard work and it's breaking down all the techniques for them. They need to understand basically the way I, I tell them is right now they have a Japanese mouth. Yeah. Meaning they have, they're using Japanese speaking habits to speak in English. And sometimes that works out okay, and sometimes that doesn't work out okay. Yeah. So we have to break down those bad habits and build up new English-speaking habits. And we do that by training the mouth, physically understanding the techniques, the position of the tongue, the, 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 the opening of the mouth, the, the use of the lips. And then we just reinforce that with constant correction through speaking activities. Yeah. How does that look like in the beginning? Is that like really training hard with um, like minimal pairs or things like that? Well, I have a, um, a dictation activity I use that, that isolates and focuses on individual sounds. Uh, it's a very quick activity, like a, well, 
in the beginning, it's not quick because <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of struggle. There's a lot of explanation. There's a lot of support. But it goes from being the most despised and challenging uh, activity to the easiest eventually. So what could take up to 30 minutes eventually ends up taking five minutes. Right. And that's just time and repetition. Um, then there's, you know, I use some of the well-used tools that other teachers, most teachers use, you know, things like tongue twisters, conversation. Mm -hmm. But then we also do uh, sentences. Um, you know, if I want to focus on a particular um, tense and grammar, let's say some students, they don't quite get how to use the present tense. Then yeah. we'll just drill making present tense sentences, basic ones. And in the course of that, they'll make some pronunciation mistakes. And at every turn, I'll correct that mistake. Right. Yeah. It's essentially the premise of this entire podcast. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We've recorded 600 episodes about that very yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And the hilarious thing is, this is why there's a huge difference between learning something and just understanding something. I will literally teach someone how to do the TH sound, for example. And I'm not joking. Five seconds later, it'll be wrong. Yeah. Because they understand it. They understand what to do, how to make the sound, but they don't have the habit to automatically take over their speech. And that's why there's a that's why repetition is so important to build that habit, that muscle memory. Yeah. That's something I always try to drill in our students' heads. If you imagine a normal native English speaker, like we have said the TH sound millions of times, quite literally. And if a Brazilian or a Japanese person is starting to train the TH sound for the first time and they train for like 20 minutes one day, say, okay, they have like what, 50 reps? <laughs> <You know, it's> the, <laughs> yeah. I don't know the exact number, but we're talking about hours and hours of repetition. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any sort of, this is a student that, or this is a question that I receive from students all of the time, um, just kind of a time frame for when they could start seeing some sort of progression, because I think most people know, okay, in the beginning, this will take a while, but when can people really start feeling like, okay, maybe, maybe this guy, Joe, knows what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, up until that point, they're just looking at me doubtfully. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've noticed, okay, I would say first that pronounce improvements based on our style of teaching kind of sneak up on people. Yeah. And I'd also caveat it by saying, you know, there's so many factors. You know, some people really do have a natural ability for language, I think. Mm -hmm. um, some people have a mouth crowded full of crooked teeth, which also could influence pronunciation. But generally yeah. speaking, I look at about 30 hours is more or less a turning point for a lot of my students. Yeah. I love thinking about any sort of skill acquisition in hours as opposed to like days or weeks. It's like, how many months until I'm fluent? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. How much are you studying? During yeah. those months. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, how much are people practicing on their own? Um, I say hours because before I opened the school, I was doing private lessons and they're hourly. You know, some people would take one hour a week, some people would take three hours a week or six hours a week. So that hourly measurement worked well in their heads and um, it would be about 30 hours. And the thing is, if if a student's taking one hour a week, that's like seven months. Yeah. You know, six to seven months, which feels like a long time. But if they were to crunch it in a full-time class, you know, within a month or two, you know, depending on the person and what they're doing on their own. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of wild to think about. If you're studying an hour a week, 30 hours, a six or half a year, more or less. Yeah. And just changing that to an hour a day, which is totally doable for most people, especially nowadays, <laughs> an hour a day 
compounds that into to a month. So you can dramatically change things in a month if you want. Yeah, absolutely. To. If you're doing the right things, you know, and, and that's the key is to do the right things. Study smart, study the right things. You know, that's why a lot of students, when they find us, after studying for six months at a big school, they still have a lot to improve because, in my opinion anyway, they weren't really studying the right things. Yeah. Do you have... Okay, I, this is a teacher-to-teacher -teacher question here. So I know that I personally have a tendency to really want to get technical about pronunciation, and I also want my students to be, like, phonetically obsessed and I don't think that's a good approach. Um, so I've really scaled that back over the last few years. But number one, do you kind of fall into that trap of like, okay, well, this is how we produce this sound because your tongue position is slightly lower and then you have your vellum <laughs> doing something? <laughs> or do you kind of leave the technical stuff to your personal knowledge and just try to give them as much practical advice as possible. And I'm mostly, yeah. yep, sorry, go ahead. I, I think that's the entirety of my question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was just going to try to add a, yeah. some sort of preamble. I think you got into a teacher habit because I do the same thing where I, sometimes I feel as if I have to ramble on a little longer to give my students some time to think. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, I'm... I keep it as simple as possible. I don't get too technical. Um, I don't. I don't want to get into too technical terms because I don't want to explain things that I don't need to explain. So I always try to dumb it down, or simple. I should say simplify it as much as possible. Also, depending on the sound, um, I have little tricks that I use to. I mean, for example, our sound, very difficult to teach for a number of reasons. One is I can't show the student what's happening inside my mouth. Yeah. Whereas with TH, they can see what I'm doing. Yeah. So I have to find, you know, tricks or, you know, techniques that I can put their mouth and tongue in the correct position and have them understand what's happening. Let them be aware of that. And... If I simplify it as much as possible, I find it, it gets absorbed easier. The only way sometimes that I get obsessed is I get a little too picky. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I try to catch myself and, and kind of walk back from the ledge. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any good R sound tricks up your sleeve? Well, my main trick is I compare it to the N sound. I saw this video online, this old video, and inspired me very much to use the N sound as the introduction to the R sound. And uh, because to me, they're, they are very similar. You know, there's a very small difference between R and N, and I find it really helps students to understand how to exactly to place their tongues, um, especially for yeah. Japanese. They have a very different cheat that they use to make the R sound. And it mm -hmm. doesn't work. I mean, it works, I suppose, sufficiently well. But the problem with it is it's not correct, number one. So it makes combining other pronouncing words and combining other sounds difficult. But also it makes the tongue very, very tired very quickly. Yeah. So, yeah, that would be my trick. And ends the way to go. Nice. Yeah. To be honest, I have never thought about that, I don't think. Hmm. Or at least not in quite some time. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. So, Joe, do you have any, like, practical tips or resources for the majority of students that cannot physically travel to Toronto or go to an English school or have a professor that is well-versed in phonetics and phonology, do you have any just kind of recommendations to start pushing them in the right direction to help them see the light? Right. That's so <laughs> tough. Um, 
I'm just asking you all of the questions that I yeah, failed yeah. to answer myself. <laughs> all right. Watch this uh, podcast. Listen to this podcast. Um, <laughs> it, it can be very difficult in the beginning if students really don't understand which sounds they're doing wrong and how to correct them. So unfortunately, I, I mean, it's, I tell my students, unfortunately, you need to actually improve your pronunciation before you can practice by yourself. Yeah. Because I don't want them to practice something wrong and build a bad habit. Which means um, some sort of mentorship or, or teacher is needed in the beginning to correct mistakes, to build those initial habits, or at least to teach the technique properly in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But but once that technique is down, yeah, absolutely read out loud. Uh, uh, students can record themselves and play it back. They can compare it to audiobooks. Audiobooks, in a way, can act as a teacher because it's obviously correct. So they can compare their recordings to audiobooks. Um, tongue twisters can be great. Uh, a lot of tongue twisters, they'll focus on one kind of um, one, one sound or one word. Um, pattern over and over again so it's, it's a good way to build up uh build up that that technique yeah yeah um, just drilling i drill with my students um problem sounds with um, vowels so for example if they're doing the th sound for your listeners as well mm -hmm. i'll have a list of vowel sounds and we'll practice the th with those vowel sounds in the beginning position, then I'll move the TH to the middle position, and then I'll move the TH to the end position. Uh, there's no real point in practicing TH by itself because TH is in words and it's always combined with vowels and other consonants. So. <laughs> Precisely. Um, yeah, so things like that. Uh, yeah. Goodness. Yeah, I mean, Google has a nice tool, I think it's called Pronto, where it, it, it pronounces words and you can if you use it through your mobile you can record yourself pronouncing the same word and it'll actually suggest some corrections yeah nice yeah um so there's things that can be done it's just hard in the beginning because if the pronunciation is inaccurate it needs to be re it needs to be corrected that, that course needs to be corrected yeah yeah i find that to be the most difficult step as well I normally suggest that even if a student is not working with us or doing one of our courses, it's probably a good idea just to have like the very basics of phonetics, phonology, just to kind of get a better perspective of, okay, each language has a certain collection of sounds and all language is composed of some combination of these sounds and you're going to have problems with some of them. And if you can recognize that, then at least you can perhaps express that to a teacher. Even if they are not a pronunciation pro, they can still tell you, okay, you are definitely having difficulties with this sound. <laughs> That's not right. And that can at least start pointing you in the right direction. I completely agree. And I would add one more thing is that, I mean, at least with my Japanese students, it could be a cultural difference. I'm not sure if this happens with... Brazilian English learners, but when a student hires a teacher, they work for the student. Yeah. So the students should have no problem telling the teacher what they want to study and what they want to happen in that lesson. So it's super, super important to get corrected. And if a teacher is not correcting a student, at all or very infrequently, then that student needs to speak up and ask to be corrected all the time. Yeah, I think that is an extremely important point that we work for you. <laughs> this is our yeah. job. This is what we like to do. Most teachers want to correct you all of the time. A lot of, a lot of our students will be shy, at least initially. Um, but you have to be pretty forceful about what you want. Like if I'm taking like a Portuguese or a Spanish class, I'm very clear on the first lesson. Like I want to sound exactly like a Brazilian. If I say anything that does not sound exactly like a Brazilian, tell me to stop 
and then you say it, then I'll say it, and then we'll just play that game for a while. Yeah, yeah but you got to be clear right. about what you want. And Absolutely. Make that but known. having said that, if a student comes to my class and asks me to teach them only grammar, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, me either. No. Yeah. <laughs> there are <limits. laughs> There are plenty of schools <laughs> for the grammarian students. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Awesome, Joe. So it was a pleasure having you on the show. It was a pleasure getting to talk to you a little bit more, getting to know you a little better. Do you have any words of wisdom for all English students trying to make the transition to a more fruitful and productive path of pronunciation or just anything you would like to leave all of our listeners with? Yeah, I would say that you know, if you feel like you're in a place where you're not improving anymore, you might, you might have plateaued, you feel stuck, you know, chances are that you can reinvigorate your studies with uh, a focus on pronunciation. At least that's been my experience with my students. I would say don't try to avoid getting frustrated because there are going to be days where we'll feel frustrating, but keep at it. And um, yeah, come visit us at, uh, on the website, uh, torontoenglishschool.com. And we've got Instagram and Facebook also. So swing by, say hello. Awesome. Love to hear from you all. Yeah. So check out everything that Joe has to offer at torontoenglish.com. On all of the Instagram stuff, we will put that in the show notes. Naturally, if you are listening to this in April 2020, Probably do not visit physically, <laughs> but hopefully sooner than later. And thanks again, Joe. It was a pleasure yeah. having you. My pleasure. Thanks for your time. It was a lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you. Muito obrigada por ter escutado mais um episódio aqui do nosso Inglês Micro Rádio. E eu queria falar que a cada mês nós temos um challenge novo. E onde é que você pode achar esse challenge? Vá lá no inglesnicro.com. Aproveita e dá uma espiada em tudo que a gente está fazendo e de produtos novos, de preços super acessíveis e até coisas grátis que temos para vocês. Claro que quando a gente pensa em algum produto, a gente pensa em todos os níveis de pessoas né, de inglês que a gente pode oferecer e alcançar. Então, se você é básico, intermediário ou avançado, pode fazer. Nós aqui abrimos as, os braços para todos, no, todos nós, né, porque eu me incluo nessa, e acolhemos todo mundo. Então é isso, vá lá no inglesnecru.com, aproveite e fique sabendo um pouquinho mais sobre a gente, tá bom? Te vejo no próximo episódio, hein? Bye!